Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are Frederick Lowe Award winner Aaron Kamler and painter Robert Charles Dennehy. And you see these beautiful palm trees on the set. Those were all painted by him, and we're going to see some more when he comes on the show. Erin Kamler was born and raised in Michigan. She graduated from Sarah Lawrence College. She attended the University of Michigan. And since she was a teenager, and after composing and writing and performing in musicals, uh, forever, I guess, <laughs> right? <laughs> Pretty much. She's uh, currently uh, uh, a, a Compose it, composed and wrote. Um, divorce the musical. Currently, Currently. right. Divorce. <laughs> um, but the other thing that I think is so interesting is that you're at USC at the Annenberg True. School of Communications. And I'm wondering and how School does, of International Relations. Of International yeah. Relations. And why are you doing this when you've composed and written and uh, been musical since you were three years old? <laughs> well, it's, it's a good question. Um, I also have a lot of interest in um, in Southeast Asia, and particularly in cultural diplomacy, which is what I'm studying at, at Annenberg. How do you use that in your musicals? Well, the idea is to, <laughs> the idea is to use um, musical theater and the arts as oh. a way of bridging cultures. Oh, that's so, great. Um, for, for example, once Divorce the Musical is produced abroad, it c could potentially open up and facilitate conversation about marriage and marriage law in other cultures that potentially don't have the same kinds of laws that we do. I thought at one point you performed in Japan and India and Thailand That's Indonesia. <laughs> You've performed in all those places and I thought maybe that had some kind of a bearing on your international interest. It is the way that I became interested in international relations, being a performer and you know traveling around the world and playing to very diverse audiences who have very um, you know different ways of of interpreting music or of, of understanding music. The great thing about music and theater, I think, too, is it's a wonderful bridge. And what did you do in those other countries? What uh, kind of performing? I was a, a recording artist, so I had uh, albums that I would sing and play, oh, play piano. Oh. Is it really true that you started at nine years old and you were writing and creating a production company? That's yeah, almost I, impossible, isn't it? I was an ambitious kid, I think. You don't you look know, precocious, so. though. <laughs> I was a little bit. I mean, I, I started I started acting and I started singing, you know, around age eight or nine, and I just became really, I, I loved musical theater. I also was really lucky to be fostered by artists in the community I grew up in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Was your family musical? A uh, little bit, but no, they're academics and uh, teachers. But it was more of the people you were with? Yeah, yeah really, really solid artistic community there. Do you play an uh, instrument? I play piano, and that's how I compose. That's what so. I was, I was wondering. Um, but at nine years old were you writing? I started and composing. I started I kind of self-taught myself on the piano and just started writing songs. And as my interest in theater grew, I put the songs together with stories. And so, so. here we are, 15 full length musicals by the time you're 18 years old. Yeah. I, I mean I almost one a year. I was busy. <laughs> Where'd you get your subject matter? Um, I worked with kids my age, particularly like so teenagers, friends of girls, yeah, right? you know, girls who were friends, and we really created a lot of the shows together. Um, some of the subject matters I got through school, I wrote a, a little operetta about the Spanish Civil War, but you know, <laughs> really you? the subject was about a girl coming of age during that time, so, you but know. But you used school. Yeah. That I was used, great. I always used the subjects I was studying. Some of your plays have been performed at the Joseph pa Public Theater, and, and what kind of work has that been? Um, I was a finalist in the Young Playwrights Festival, which yeah. is Stephen Sondheim's um, wonderful, you know, nonprofit. 
How in New fabulous. York. So yeah. fabulous. Really amazing experience. So um, three of my one act plays were, were performed there. One act, but so, yeah. so you don't just write musicals. That I was writing straight plays too at that time. I see, I see. So, so yeah. those were the ones that were the public theater. Then, mm -hmm. do they go to different places? Those I didn't really pursue at that time. I just thought, what well, this is a great experience. I but know. I was, you know, I was I had other things to focus on too. So, so one of the things, divorce the musical. You wrote another thing, a, a story about Calabasas. You write in the areas where you're living and yeah. where you know? I'm interested in really using musical theater as a bridge, again, between cultures, so to talk about issues that are come up in a community. And so well, how, well, tell us about the Calabasas one. Well, that one's still um, in development. It's sort oh, of the beginning is. stages. But again, it's the idea is to really use the work to serve as the voice of a community or to, to talk to a community through the work. And then tell us about Divorce the Musical, which has been extended and extended and extended at the Hudson theater. It's going and, really well. Yeah, <laughs> tell us the story, of course. <laughs> um, the story is about a couple in their 30s who decides after four years of marriage that they want different things. She wants to focus on her career as an actress. He wants her to have a baby and have a more traditional you know, family life. So they decide to go their separate ways. They want to do this amicably. like They really want to work it out and you know, be friends at the end. But once they hire the lawyers, they're sort of steered down these paths of becoming enemies in order to survive the divorce. And it, the whole thing sort of escalates and escalates and escalates until the end. And, and of course, there is a moralistic ending. You know, don't let the lawyers take <laughs> oh, over your lives. Oh, very moralistic. And try, well, and try to, you know, try to work, work it out. out. Yeah. When they first decide that they're going to be friendly, what muse song was that? Uh, close to the beginning, there's a song called Therapy where they really <laughs> decide to, they're in the therapist's office after getting married and a few years after getting married and they want to, they decide to get a divorce, but then, um, then they have a, a song called First Attempt to Resolve It. And it goes? Uh, a little bit of the words or a little of the... Let's not tear each other up, okay, let's settle this amicably, something like that. Yeah, so that's the, the dialogue. It's uh, the whole show is a lot of sung dialogue and songs that really flow from one to the next very seamlessly without spoken dialogue. And and where did you get your actors? Did you have people in mind? We had a wonderful casting director, uh, Michael Donovan. Who, oh, I know Michael. He's been on these, the show. Oh, okay. He's great. Yeah, so you know him. He's wonderful. <laughs> And he brought in these, you know, incredibly talented people. Oh, we're so, so fortunate to have them all. So you were really happy the minute they came, they could do what you wanted They're them to do? an amazing cast. Also, one of my guests is Rick Sparks. He's, He's been on the amazing. show. Isn't He's he wonderful. great? He makes yeah. it happen, doesn't he? Really he really does. And do you watch him when he directs? I have. I, I sort of watch him in awe. You know, I'm silent, and I just, the things that, the way he puts pictures together on stage and the way he creates movement um, is just seamless. It's really amazing to watch. He was an actor, so mm -hmm. he has that feeling uh, he for the actors. He connects with the actors right. very, very well. And what about your arranger, David O? David's great. He's a genius. Tell us about him. Um, David came in and took my score and set it to piano, a woodwind player, oh. and a cellist. Oh, that's what happens with an arranger? That's what they do. I yeah. see. They take what you, you know, I, wrote I wondered the whole thing why. On the piano. Yeah, that's what I thought. Right, but then David came in and he sort of put his own interpretation onto the music and his own voice into it. Does it change from what you it have? It does. It does. I mean, it really, he's really put his mark on it. So the cello brings out that pathos, probably. Definitely. But then there's also a lot of humor that the cello and the woodwind player, too, bring um. into it. And so they become characters in the show. So what other creative uh, support? At well, the we have an amazing set designer. Oh, right. Um, we didn't you know, talk Danny about that. Danny Sistoni, a wonderful costume designer, Denitza Blitznikova. Um, the lighting is gorgeous, Jer Jeremy Pivnik. And, and, of course, the production team is just, you know, they're really champions of the show. What, um, what happens? This is a very small theater. I don't know. How many? 99? 99. How, how would that translate to Broadway? Well, it's an intimate show, but I think that you can keep the intimacy, you know, of the set design. What what happens in the show is that most of the characters or most of the actors play different roles, so oh. they're constantly coming in and out of doors and changing costume, and there's always something going on, kind of driving the show forward. Um, I think that it actually would translate really well to a like a big off Broadway house or oh, a small you do? Broadway big, house. Big. I think it could, um, but we need the right 
you know, really the right set designer and the right people who make the visuals. That's not my job. And then so. what happened? Oh, you, can you just give it away like that <laughs> when it's to, your baby? How do you do that? It's not easy all the time. <laughs> but you know, the the great thing is I really trust everybody who's who's working on the show, and and they're all just such talented, brilliant people that and they know what they're doing. D does it go? I'm asking about this because it has been in L.A. for so long and people have talked about it or talking about it for, I don't know, several months several now. Several months, yeah. And where would it go next? We have different ideas about that. I think the producers are definitely looking into the next stage of life for the show, whether it's New York or on the road or oh, another so, theater. Yeah, you know. Would it be another theater in L.A.? Could it, it depends be, on like, Could it be things. Arizona? Could it be Texas? I think it could have a life in any of those places. I think it has a broad enough appeal. Besides school, and yes. you must be in school a lot, right? Uh -huh. A lot of time. I am. It keeps my keeps my mind busy. How, well, good. <laughs> you continue to write and yeah. perform. How do you do that all? Um, it's a it's a real balancing act. That's that's pretty much what, it. What kind of classes are you taking? Um, the, the, one of the classes that I love the most is this cultural diplomacy class, oh. and that's what I was telling you about. Tell the us. Really, the real. Um, opportunity to, to talk about culture and how the arts are used culturally and to facilitate cross-cultural conversation. But where, okay, we see that, but in what countries? Uh, I'm particularly interested in Thailand and Southeast Asia, and um, I speak Thai and I've done some oh, work in Thailand. Oh, that's why. So, uh, yeah, uh. and this summer I'll be there as well, um, hopefully starting to write a new show. Okay, oh, you'll so, write it about Thailand see, because yeah. that's your milieu, right? Hopefully. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it was really wonderful, Erin, to have you and to see the way you put together this successful musical. Thank you very much. We'll be right back with our artist, Robert Charles Dennehy. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Artist Robert Charles Dennehy was born and raised in Cleveland. He wasn't raised in Cleveland, he was raised in Denver, where he studied art and printmaking at the Metropolitan State College. After earning his Bachelor of Arts, Robert moved to New York City, where he showed his work on the Upper West Side. Yes. Yes, yes you did. But it didn't last very long, did it? You started, fur you started, got into furniture. It was actually it was an exciting time to work in furniture. There were a lot of well-known architects designing buildings and then the furniture to go in it. So it was exciting. And how did you, what were you doing actually? Were you building furniture? I was, I, it was my company. So yes, I, I ran the business, but also I was designing stuff and I had, a, I had a, a great group of people working with me. What kind of furniture? Well, we did a lot of uh, custom cabinetry. I did oh. work for the Metropolitan Museum. So oh, I did tell people that I still have work at Metropolitan Museum. Oh, that's good. Yes, that's a good <laughs> we like that. And, uh, but we, I really got to see how New York, the, the real high society lives in New York. It was, it was amazing. So you did, Colorado you did design. Design, and we, we built it. And, um, and you worked with designers. How did you find designers for your company? They actually would come to us. We were, we were very well known. We had a good reputation, and they have a tendency to be very lo loyal. If, if you are the easy designers. to work with, they come back, yeah. And then what about the architects? How did you get associated with architects? Well, the designers would recommend us to the architects, and then they would, oh. they would really come by. Um, we met a lot of very, very important architects, and it was, it was an exciting time to be in New York. There was a lot of money, a lot of how, how long were you there? Was it during the 80s? It was during the 80s. High it, time. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing time to live there. So, so, so were they local architects, or did they come from all they, over? They were, we worked with IMP, so there, there was, they were international um, I am Pei lived in New York, but he was international, yeah. yeah. And uh, Michael Graves. Oh, the really? Memphis school. It, it was very exciting. So they would, could, could come to you and then take your work to their various countries or cities that, where they were yeah, designing well, they things? they were also doing buildings in New York at the time. There was a lot of building going on. It, it was just very exciting. It, it, it wasn't painting, but it was very creative. I, I, I felt very in touch with uh, the art community. So since the early 90s, you've been actually painting. I, I left all that and started painting full time. And, and, and how can you make such a move from a big company and being the, to this little kind of lonely painting life? Well, I actually, I learned a lot uh, with the cabinet company and I brought that discipline with me. 
What was the name of the company? It was Kraz Dunahay Associates, and my my business partner at the time, his name was Peter Kraz. I see. Which, when and you, you look were at done. It, yeah, yeah. So, it, <laughs> although people thought it was crazy Dunahay, but it was Kraz Dunahay, <laughs> and it was uh, it was good. But I did learn a lot about uh, dealing with clients, and there's a lot of part, a lot of things about being an artist that you really need to to bring with you as a business sense. It's not just you know, if you're going to do it for a living and and are very serious about a career, you need to know how to do not only painting, but you need to know how to run a business. But painters don't realize that. Artists don't realize that. That's one of the hardest parts of an artist's life, I think. It really is. And it, it is not, it's not easy, but it is something that you don't learn in school. I'm, I'm surprised at that. But it, it becomes, you have to treat it like a job. I'm there every day. I work, I work long hours. And I you love it. You mean painting? It. Painting. I, I, it's the best, I, I say job, but it's the best time I've ever had. I love it, but it is work. And it's not just painting. It's, there's, a, you know, there's accounting. If you're going to sell your work and, and, and promote it, you have to be on top of things. You have to know what you're yeah. doing. You started the opposite way. Well, first you started in art school, I then did. you started in business. Yes. So it actually worked out very well. Then you went back, so yeah. you learned everything along the way. Well, I also learned, uh, you know, in, in the cabinet making and, and furniture, I, I learned how to Make all of my stretcher bars, and oh, that's so great, I. Yeah. It comes in handy. There's a lot of tools. That, yes, these are all uh, handmade. You still bars. make your own stretcher yes, bars? Yes, yes, because it's it allows me. I'm pretty, pretty fussy about how things turn out. So. How how is it that you're fixated on palm trees? Did you paint something before that? I painted a lot of different things, and I do a lot of different styles. But the palm trees have always been so well received, and I. They really are a pleasure to work with. I mean, I love the image. It, it's a great positive image. But is another tree like a palm tree? Is there another tree like that? I don't think so. I, I discovered this very early in the series, and that's that everybody loves palm trees. And I thought, <laughs> that's strange. Every painting I did of a palm tree, everybody loved it. So I, I started to analyze that. And it really, I think what it is, is the palm tree really symbolizes there's a better life. If you hate your job, if, you, if, if it's snowy, you can always go someplace. It, it's really, it's a reminder that life is good. I know Leah Skidmore is your gallery representative. Yes, she's a good friend. And the first time that I walked into her apartment, she's married to Michael Zakian, who's the director yes. of the Weissman Museum at Pepperdine. I went, oh, that palm tree. It's, it's like it catches your eye. I, I, I'm glad you say that because, first of all, as an artist, I love the people of my work. But that's not uncommon. That's really been the general reaction to th this work and that's really great to have not only work that sells well but that people love and, and just love to have around them. Tell us that story, I love it, about how you started painting and then you started cutting the canvas. I don't under I didn't well, really I did, get it. I, the series started off, I, I had started a painting of a street in Beverly Hills with the palm trees oh, right. and the painting was a large painting. It didn't really work out compositionally so I took a pair of scissors to it, cut it down to make a small painting. It, it, After you'd painted it? <laughs> yes. It, well, I, I do cut down my work sometimes. But the, re, the result, the important result was on the studio floor, I'm looking at these chunks of canvas with palm trees on them. And I picked up a piece and immediately, with the, part of a branch, I thought, I'm going to do the series of uh, close-up of palm trees and it's going to have this snapshot approach to, to composition. And you'll notice every painting, somewhere the palm tree leaf goes off the edge of the canvas. Yes, I noticed it, you wrap it around the... It was um, an important design well, feature, yes. Is that what you like to do? Yes. And, but also, it looks like it sits away from the canvas. Well, it is. Um, there's a use of... The technique is something I sort of developed uh, just through practice and trial and error, but the tree itself is painted in a transparent oil paint. And the white that you're seeing, the highlights... It was really the, the white of the canvas behind it. And then in contrast, I always paint the background afterwards. And it creates a dynamic, that a tension that is, is just not how normal painting is done. It just doesn't look like you could go in and do all this intricate background. It is. Um, it, painting it the is tree, like that? Yes, painting <laughs> the tree is, is, I love that part. The painting the background, two or three coats, uh, it gets a little tedious at oh, times. Oh, two or three coats. Yeah, because yes. I was going to ask you, you yes. use canvas, oil. And um, I have lots of brushes, but I also I, I paint with a lot of different things. What I have, about this? I see there's scraping on it. I do a lot of stuff with removing paint, and oh. it is. I'll go to a hardware store and I'll find a, a rubber sponge or a, a, a pet brush or something. And you use it? And I use everything. It, it's um, it, it's really a fun to work that way. 
Um, are you a colorist? Do you consider yourself a colorist? Because these are not just trees, right. you know, without a background. These are trees without backgrounds. I mean, without the uh, context. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> there are that, no other things around well, it. Well, it is. Um, the whole series was never about necessarily rendering a, a, a specific tree or being bot botanically correct. It was about evoking a feeling of ah, the palm tree. I so see. there is usually, very rarely is there a reference to any type of landscape. It is really, I wanted that pop art feeling where it just pops and it is really a color relationship. The, the color um, becomes very important because it is this tree on a solid background. Um, I asked you about portraits, if you had ever painted portraits, and you said, all of my trees have names. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to just show some of these. This is Arthur. And is, is there a reason why you choose these colors? Well, um, I, these particular paintings, and for the show at Leah's Skidmore's Gallery, I knew that I needed a nice range of colors. So it was, it was, the whole show was conceived as a total unit. Aladdin Lizzie. Yes. Oh, this is nice. This is a shot of my studio in Palm Springs, and you can oh, see it's... This is great. I spend so much time there, but it's a great studio. I love the studio, but it has really high ceilings. And so I started doing these almost life-size palm trees. And you call it Studio 661 yeah. because that must be your address? That is the address, <laughs> but it, it's, um, it's just shy of the devil. <laughs> no. It, it, um, 666. <laughs> it, it, is, uh, it just seemed like it's such an amazing place, and I spent so much time there. I thought it should have a name. I loved the way Warhol oh, named the see, studio, yeah. the factory. The factory, right. So it is Studio 661, and it, that's how people refer to it. So I'm just going to show a couple more of these. This is Leah Skidmore's gallery, Skidmore Contemporary Art at Bergamot Station. This is the current show. that. What I'm size are all these at her gallery? They're all 48 inches wide, and they are six feet high. And it is, uh, they're, they're pretty good-sized paintings. They're, they're almost, the scale is very... Uh, human scale. I mean, that's about the size of. They feel the like you're standing yeah. right with them. This also is at the gallery. Yes, yes. she has a. It's a beautiful gallery. It's, well, it's, one thing that do you call this work? And I'm going to show this okay. last piece. Do, well, we talk, and this is called Miller. Uh, do you do you call this work abstract or realist? Well, it is. A lot of people always say, "Boy, they're so real. They look like photographs." And there is no photographic process. I. I I actually paint them all from memory and... You don't take photos? I, I, no, I, I do go out sometimes and sketch a couple of branches to get some of the foreshortening down. But for the most part, any photographic references, it, it, it really distracts from, from the painting rather than do it. But there is a lot of very abstract aspects to it. The trunks are very, um, very loose and gestural. And it, it is, I think that because they look sort of real, People start to think that they are, and then that just snowballs. And if yeah. you really stop to look at it, there's some very abstract parts of it. You, you mentioned Andy Warhol. Um, he always painted very flat. Yes. And when he did his portraits, he always took all the wrinkles out and, yes. and made people long, thinner necks and more beautiful than they were. Do you treat your palm trees the same Actually, way? Actually, there is that, yes. I, I love the <laughs> quote that um, he said, yeah, just keep in the beautiful parts. And, and palm trees in reality, are pretty dry and they're windblown and the branches are, uh, they're, not, they're not gorgeous plants up close. And I've removed all that. I, they're I wanted just to have the passion of a palm tree. And so it is, there might be some dried leaves in the paintings, but they're treated as gorgeous, very sculptural aspects of the tree. Did you so, ever meet a palm tree you didn't like? <laughs> I grew up in Colorado. I, it wasn't until I moved to San Francisco oh, that I made the distinction that there was even fan palms or the different species. So to me it was, um, there's still something very exotic about them. And I, I, they're an amazing, very primitive plant. They're, they're gorgeous. Well, you've brought the gorgeousness of the palm trees to us. Thank you I, so much, Robert. I, I, appreciate being here and it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for driving yeah. up from the desert. We appreciate it. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. But email me, jaquinn1, J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. And we'll see you next time.